Uh, welcome to GUI and in-web browsers uh, weekly call for 9th of October 2019. Um, I'll be leading this call and we have an agenda. If anyone present on the call, we got Dietrich, we got Hendrik. Uh, if anyone wants to join next week, feel free to join. <laughs> we are back. Uh, so uh, we got an agenda and I'll share the agenda. Uh, the first item on the list is uh, pre-caching assets, uh, making web UI work in offline mode. Um, so that one is mine. So I will give a quick update on this one. Um, so the idea is um, when user installs IPFN, IPFS companion, uh, the first thing they want to do, especially in the next release, there will be a button. When everything is set up, there will be a button, open web UI. So that's the very first thing a new user is doing, opening web UI. The problem is if, the web, uh, if it's the very first time user is opening web UI, the web UI is not in the local repo. The web UI is fetched from IPFS and needs to be loaded from the network itself. That's pretty good for like dog fooding and stuff. However, it's not that good for user experience and also not that good for uh, offline use cases. So for example, if someone goes to, uh, to a cafe or uh, to internet cafe or a friend uh, where the, there's a Wi-Fi and they install IPFS um, companion and like IPFS desktop and they shut the laptop down and then go some place without the networking and they want to play with IPFS. They try to open web UI and nothing happens because the node is not able to find those uh, blocks. So it's also not connected to the network and it's not able to open web UI. So that's pretty bad for the offline uh, uh, use case. And the way I figured out to mitigate this is to basically pre-cache uh, web UI in a way that's native to IPFS. So the idea is to basically uh, bundle an archive with web, web UI assets uh, with the browser extension itself. And then on the very first time a uh, user is uh, starting uh, IPFS companion, we check if web UI is present in local repository. If it's not present in local repository, we check if the tar archive is present in the bundle uh, because not, uh, we may not want to bundle it on every platform. We need to figure it out uh, if it's okay to bundle it uh, on Firefox and other stuff. But uh, if the web UI is not in local repository, we have it locally as a file and we just import that file to local node on the first boot. And that's pretty fast. Uh, it's like the, the uncompressed web UI is about 22 megabytes, but compressed is 11 megabytes uh, with companion itself. So companion uh, on its own is four megabytes. Uh, if we add uh, web UI, uh, it's uh, 11 compressed. Uh, and it's pretty cool. The pretty cool thing is that we, what we include in the bundle is a tar archive, which is uh, an archive which is not compressed itself. And companion and web UI share a lot of assets such as like fonts uh, and some like uh, some images uh, and other assets. Um, so those are basically the duplicated. That's why we got this uh, pretty good compression. And I feel like 11 megabytes for uh, Chromium extension is not that bad, not that good either, but uh, you get this uh, offline first experience. Um, so that's implemented and we'll land at some point in the future. Uh, pretty happy with it because it's uh, not specific to web UI. We, this way we are able to, be, we may even like extract this and create a library for uh, doing that in other apps. I, I know that in IPFS desktop, we sort of uh, have a web UI shipped locally because uh, there are different constraints, but 
for browser extensions and other applications that want to ship some data that needs to be available immediately without fetching it from the network. This may be uh, useful. And in IPFS Companion, uh, this means uh, when you open uh, web UI, it will be available instantly. So the first load won't take long time. Uh, right now, it can be a few seconds of even up to a minute if your network is slow and you are not lucky. Um, so that's the pre-caching assets. Um, and uh, the next item is experiments in collaborative website hosting. Um, I'll probably move that after uh, update on IPFS in web browsers. So Dietrich, do you want to take this one? Sure. So thank you very much, uh, Lytle, for helping with the IPFS and web browsers blog post, which I will share here momentarily. I have really a lot of browser windows open. Let's see if this is the right one. Hey, there it is. The IPFS web browsers update. So we put together a summary of kind of where we've been uh, with browser integrations and where we want to get to, but more like a hint where we want to get to. Most of it's talking about where we are today. Uh, integrations with uh, Brave and the work that uh, everyone's been doing, Lytle driving that for the last uh, oh, almost or over a year now at this point. Um, so really the, a culmination of really a lot, a lot of work and a lot of help from Brave's end as well. It's so nice to have a browser just so willing to work with us and experiment and, and uh, exposing capabilities and figuring out what really needs to happen to be able to make a distributed network work in, in entirely inside of the browser. Uh, and then also the kind of first public announcement of us working with Opera and Opera uh, planning on shipping IPFS support uh, with the full addressing spec in Opera for Android uh, by the end of this year. So that should, should, should be interesting. And uh, I'd, Talk to to uh, to Ollie this morning a little bit about getting the, the bootstrap servers uh, up and ready for uh, that uh, at, at some point if we see boost in traffic from from both of these things happening and better awareness around them as well. Uh, you know, the, talking a little bit about the the stages, like where we want to get to eventually, uh, but there and and some of the background history and why it's hard to change browsers. Um, uh, very cool to be able to have all of the videos available from the various IPFS events where where people actually talked about this kind of stuff. All the, going back all the way to uh, to last summer when we have uh, Idol and Kyle demoing. Like I think that was actually only a, well that might have been a month or something after the Web was was fully announced. Uh, uh, really a, a a scroll back through the history. Uh, and a hint of where we want to go. And one of the things that we didn't really talk about in this post, and then I feel like I'd love to be able to talk about more once we get into 2020 planning are things like uh, co-hosting is a really big, co-hosting really speaks to kind of the core use cases that we talk about when we're talking about why IPFS is good and why we were doing this in the first place. And, and it's a, kind of our first, a first serious foray into figuring out what those user flows are for uh, I'm a regular person and I want to be able to share, I want to be able to save something. I also want to share it. What does that mean? How do I do it? Um, so I'm, I'm really, I feel like uh, with browser integration, we're getting things to the point where regular people can start to have access to a distributed network without having to install extra stuff necessarily. Um, but that next step is even more important. And that's really working out the kinks in those types of workflows. If I view Wikipedia, how can I make sure that my neighbor can also view Wikipedia if all of our internet goes out right, right then? So uh, th those, th I think that, uh, talking a little bit about that, that next view, what comes next, uh, once we have network capability, what comes next as we smooth out the bumps for those those really common use cases, how to share, how to publish, how to read what I've saved, um, and a lot of the, the, the intricacies of, of where is my stuff. Uh, I've got multiple repos, multiple devices, and web browser extension, and web content, and mobile device, you know, like uh, uh, lo lo other local GoIPFS node um, thing, thing. There's a lot of work to do to smooth out the bumps, but this is a a big progress, and the, uh, so far the reaction on uh, on the Twitters, 
been pretty good. Uh, I got retweeted by IPFS bot, so with that means it's official. It's legit. And um, really getting a lot of uh, positive feedback. People are pretty excited. And interestingly, a bunch of projects talking about MDNS. So like, I think those, it's like, uh, if, you, if you work in the space long enough, you have an understanding that, that local connectivity is one of like, it's like that, that holy grail, that cornerstone of two devices being able to talk to each other and, and, and discover each other and, then, and be able to interact, whether it's IPFS or any other, other distributed network and, and especially in offline scenarios. So that kind of like being, uh, people, people are excited to be able to see that we're, we're looking at that. And I think once we have some really good demos and, and, de and development um, scenarios like uh, APIs and workflows for browser to browser, browser communication, I think we're going to see even more interest than what we're seeing right now. So the interest that we're seeing right now is people have that kind of longer efficient, but um, once you make the local network browser to browser development a little bit easier in uh, the simple publishing workflows, like it, it's going to be, it's going to really unlock a lot of, a lot of abilities for people. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Th thanks for again for uh, for helping with that, Lytle. You, you are a a font of history, and you had all these great links to all all these videos and and resources and all the right issues. So yeah, I really appreciate. Th thank that. you for creating this uh, summary. It's a very good overview, and uh, I really like that it's so much it, stuff. It the way it balances uh, like over overarching uh, roadmap and where we are today without going too too deep into technical details that's super useful because otherwise if it was too too technical people would just shut, shut off and it was very nice to read uh, i i enjoyed it so well, thank you we'll get there oh i i do have some more i actually have some uh, that, some like visualizations i did too that kind of model what the different permutations and configurations of inside brave are that i didn't actually put in the post until i forgot but we can save those for it's a future a, post. It's a, a detailed technical post about what you did in Brave and all yep. the crazy, crazy hijinks. You're like, no, really, we're running a web server inside of a web extension. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next, the next one is Q4 OKRs. Yes. So uh, that kind of that, that that blog post actually is a lot of what we wanted to do. Like that's the P zero for kind of for for the web browsers group anyway for uh, for Q four. Um, the Opera is going to ship, and we're going to help as much as we can with that. We're going to be able to communicate those things. Brave. We talked about like what a Brave one v one looks like um, at at Browser Week, which I'll we'll talk about next uh, last last week when we were or week before last when we were in Malta. But, um, uh, and we, we actually did narrow down a set of cases and they're linked in the browser week notes about what that V1 might look like. I, th I think, but, but ultimately like the fact that it's available in the way that it is, especially now that the sockets are whitelisted and released, right? Which I didn't realize, that's awesome. Uh, I, we're standing on pretty solid grounds to be able to have like Brave is, Brave, IPFS and Brave is a thing that exists and, and people can use today. Uh, yeah. I, I really like the, the way this sort of like a soft launch of experimental embedded node with a gateway that people can see over time how like performance improves and all, uh, and all those things. And the V1 sort of, if I was the, the end user, for me, the, the V1 is when we got like IPFS colon slash slash in location bar. That's like uh, prob probably trivial, but that's like this uh, cherry on top when you like say oh it's probably done right uh but uh until until we get uh, protocol handler api or like this uh, better ux of address bar we will iterate on the performance of uh, embedded nodes which i'm pretty happy uh, is there anything that um is there anything on our end that we can do to to help the development of protocol handler, native protocol handler in Brave? Like, is that something that's happening at the Brave level or does that require underlying Chromium changes on their end? And this oh, is kind of another argument for maybe us doing more direct browser development. I, that, that would require checking in with the person that will be implementing it, but there are two ways. One is sort of like just a visual, just tackling the visual side. So basically having a, HTTP connection to HTTP gateway uh, on the backend. However, on the user interface, 
just changing address bar. And that's something can be easily done uh, with like a smaller patch. However, like introducing something uh, on par with a native protocol handler for browser extension, when you actually have no like HTTP connection, you just inject bytes right. from, from JavaScript. Uh, that's something closer to Chromium. And also we want it to be closer to Chromium. Yeah, exactly. That, that way it could be reused in other places. And uh, having the same web extension API between like Firefox and Chromium would be a dream, right? Um, and yeah, so Brave and Oprah. Um, <laughs> and it's like, uh, like as a segue, uh, I'm working on addressing some bugs related to adding files from web UI in uh, Brave when using embedded uh, uh, JS IPFS. Uh, sorry, it's a bit technical, but long story short is that we, uh, th there was a bug which uh, I found, but we did not have tests. So that's very fortunate that we have testing web UI as one of OKRs. Yes, so that, that is a nice segue. Thank you very much. Uh, but so we have two OKRs that are really kind of related to this group for Q4. And the first one is the Opera and Brave. And the second one is to uh, improve the end-to-end -end testing scenario. And we talked a little bit about this last quarter. Uh, you know, Hawk, you started some of the, some of the testing work there. And, and then Lytle added this web UI testing matrix. And what, what are the things? I actually think that the priority is probably flipped here. Like the browser stuff is P0 for Q4 and the testing is P, P1, I think. Or P2. But I actually think the testing bit it should be our, our P0. The, um, the fact that Go hasn't had a release in a while. JavaScript is having ready re regular releases, but neither of those core implementations have their end-to-end -end testing fully set up and, and running. Um, makes it even more important that we have our own end-to-end -end testing set up. So uh, in, you know, as, as those core implementations are making big changes, we need to be able to know immediately when web UI companion or desktop all break because of a change that happened from integrated core implementation or some module dependency down there in the infinite tree of modules that we depend on. So uh, that's why I think like from a, from a uh, instead of, you know, we don't want to take, you know, one step forward and two steps back. Um, are getting this test suite set up, even with this minimal, you know, matrix that that Lytle you put here, uh, really is probably the most important thing that we need to finish this quarter. Uh, so I, I'd love to be able to know how, what what do what can I do to be able to help this? What do you need from an infrastructure standpoint? Uh, how much of this work is already done and just needs to be put together and put it into CI somehow? Uh, do we want to have, do we need some daily operation? Do we need per commit operation of execution of these tests? How much of this is blocking on say infrastructure and test performance improvements like what Hugo's working on? Uh, I, it's a I, nice, I, it's a nice small table, but I feel like there's a whole lot of stuff yeah. wrapped up in there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, generally, uh, just like you said, there, there are different dimensions to this, uh, uh, I think that the starting point, I think we sort of agree, is that uh, web UI should be a home. Like the web UI repo should be a home for those tests. So basically web UI would test itself against Chromium, Firefox, and Electron. And then testing itself against uh, like Go IPFS over HTTP API, JS IPFS over HTTP API, and then like stuff like uh, embedded JS IPFS in Brave, it's something I could add on top of that, but we need this uh, like lower level infrastructure for having this test matrix. And if we have this uh, test matrix, this test suit uh, set up uh, in IPFS web UI, it's why it's important. It's important because, uh, for example, recently JS IPFS uh, has an early adopter program and the way it works, they enable other projects. Uh, maybe I, or maybe it was named something else. Er, early tester. Early tester, oh gosh. Uh, yeah, I saw some people submitted PRs to be able to add it. 
Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, if anyone is interested in uh, joining, it's uh, in uh, just IPFS repo in Docs. Uh, that's a program, and basically the idea is you can uh, join. The, uh, you can join, and uh, your project will be tested against new versions of JSIPFS as a part of uh, CI infrastructure. Uh, so that's why, uh, go going back here, if we have a web UI having self-contained tests for this, uh, then we could just submit to that pro program and uh, not only having uh, like uh, web UI testing itself, then if JSIPFS makes a change, it would run uh, web UI tests against a new version of JSIPFS. And that would be a very like a canary in a coal mine in some, if something goes wrong. Uh, and similarly, I believe the same like process could be uh, then reused for Go IPFS because uh, that's a pre pretty elegant uh, solution when you have the like project testing itself, uh, and then you just uh, have other project uh, testing itself against that project by just bumping its own version. Um, so. Uh, that's where my mind is around those tests, and I will be happy to, to help uh, with uh, setting it up uh, for, because uh, like Chromium, uh, Firefox, uh, I need that for IPFS Companion, and like Electron, uh, Enric needs that for IPFS Desktop. So we'll, uh, but like entire uh, framework, uh, it's uh, common for all cases. Uh, so as soon as, as I'm like, done with this uh, bug I'm working on for Brave, uh, I'll probably jump into this and, and help with this. Um, any thoughts on testing? Because I, I, I'm very, fo I'm very like f laser focused on just that having minimum uh, test of like adding file and adding like a directory. And then we can like, we, yeah, we can I, I, I think that's the right approach. We get all the environments covered. We get the CI running yep. and we figure out what the right cadence for the CI is. Yep. And then after that, we can add more coverage. But getting the, getting the framework up and running is the, I think the, the biggest piece. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, Anything else on testing, or do we move to? Uh, what, 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 what's your big? What's your biggest concern about? What's the biggest risk in this? What's going to be the hardest part? Because you've already set up a bunch of desktop testing and stuff before. Like on IPFS desktop, I'd like to do more end-to-end -end tests, but I can't because you can test the menus, and that's basically what IPFS desktop is. So, uh, for web UI, I think. The main issue might be uploading files. I'm not sure if it's really easy to do end-to-end -end tests simulating we are uploading something by drag and dropping or even clicking on. I think it would be easier to click on the, the buttons. But I think I searched a bit for about this and it would not be really easy to do, but I can take a look to see if that's true or not. Yeah, uh, I, I think it would be fine even if you just simulated it, right? Like I, I would say spend less time in trying to get the UI bit done than getting the, the whole flow done, even if you're actually just like have JavaScript injected into the web UI page that just is, hey, I'm in test mode, upload this, this file, this make file. And then later we can figure out uh, event simulation and, and stuff like that. Yeah, because uh, like uh, for additional context, historically, I remember when stuff broke in like Electron, it was not usually not uh, related to like user interface interaction. It was mostly stuff like, oh, uh, URL object is kind of different than in web browser or uh, the fetch event is not really the same as in Node nor like in web browser. Uh, all those like intricacies were code specific, not UI specific. So that may be a good uh, point. That also, also, there is something that if we test web UI on Electron, uh, when we add directories, it won't work on Electron. It just works with type if it's desktop because we have a custom function to call an Electron function that opens the open directory dialog. It won't work if we just 
uh, test it against a raw electron version. Yeah, that, that's that's <laughs> that, may, that may be like a, a, an open problem. How how to scope those tests? Because <laughs> like uh, I I the if we really really want to test it like end to end, including user interface uh, on like Unix and when there's like X11 windows, uh, like you can basically like programmatically uh, produce keyboard and mouse events. But that's basically writing a custom testing framework for UIs. And I sort of want to believe something like that exists uh, or could be adapted to our needs. Uh, but yeah, that, that's something we'll look at this quarter. Yeah, I think the, the, the most minimal case that gets it into CI, and then we can figure out the, the rest of the wrinkles later. Because I, I think you're right, like we're gonna, we're gonna keep, we've already experienced this problem with uh, the, the fact that El Electron is a, is a many-headed beast. <laughs> All right, uh, web browser work week. Uh, Dietrich, you gathered us uh, <laughs> for a week, so maybe you'll say a few yeah. words about that. So I think, um, let's see if I can find this. I can find the, the right tab that I'm on. I know how to browser. Yay. So, yes, we took a couple of days to do some planning for a Q4, planning for 2020, and then we, we picked an item to uh, hack on it and, and try to figure it out for a couple days. Um, the, the Q4 planning was basically, we already talked about kind of what the Q4 OKRs are. Some of that was actually like reducing the set. So instead of trying to go big in a quarter where we have lab week, a quarter where we have holidays happening, uh, and we also have 2020 planning happening, let's narrow the set of things and see how we can help the other parts of the project as well. So that includes things like helping with the async refactor uh, if we have time and then doing this, prioritizing this testing work as well. Um, the, the next big piece was actually kind of identifying what, what, the, what the set of, uh, I mean, we have a lot of stuff that we can test. There's a big list here. Uh, uh, the next big piece though was kind of like, what are our priorities for 2020 in, in, in browsers specifically? Uh, understanding what the developer experience should be for people who are developing with IPFS, uh, what a native browser implementation would look like. So we were like, we have a pretty good feel now for what it looks like when Companion is running inside of a browser, uh, what the constraints are, what the capabilities are, what kind of features we need to be able to, we need to, be able to run a full node. But a, a native browser implementation looks really differently. Um, a native browser implementation likely is not going to be Companion bundled. Uh, native imp implementation is probably going to have to be in C++ or Rust. Uh, and uh, what that looks like in Chromium is kind of TBD. In, in Firefox, they have, they're already shipping large chunks of Rust uh, and, uh, and replacing bits of the browser with that. But I'm, I'm not familiar with what that landscape looks like in Chromium. We're probably going to need a, we have an open uh, higher uh, position for a browser engineer. Uh, and I, I think at this point, what we really want, because we're going to get the most browser coverage for, for our, our money there, is be able to get an experienced Chromium developer on board and, and join the team. And I made that call out in the, in the browser's blog post as well. Uh, and then finally, the user experience part of it. So if we want to be able to have IPFS running natively in browsers and integrated, we need to be able to communicate what the threat model is, what does the design of the URL bar needs to be and why, uh, what needs to be communicated when you, the content is well one cryptographically verifiable but also can come from anywhere and it has ramifications outside of privacy and security also in the areas of power consumption cpu utilization and, and other things so then power trade-offs as well so uh a lot to figure out there uh this table is the prioritized list of 2020 projects where we went through each one of the things that we knew were open issues that we need to be able to fix in browsers to be able to get a full up and running uh, IPFS node. Uh, now, one thing in this list that is not clear is that, that, that split between what it looks like when we have Companion, what it looks like we have JS IPFS running in web content, 
And then the third, what happens when we have actual native IPFS running? So like things like the, some of the connectivity issues that we have here are less of an issue for use cases where we're using IPFS natively. But when IPFS is used in a web application running in web content and you have native IPFS node, we kind of haven't really like gamed out what that topology looks like, what the interaction looks like, and how that application runs. Does it talk to the local node? Does it talk over HTTP to the local node? Does it talk to try to get native connectivity to the local node? We just use WebRTC to speak to a built-in. Like we we haven't really figured that those bits out. So this is the kind of like the stack ranked list of things that we identified that from prior, prior prioritization perspective that we need to fix in order to address the world of IPFS and wrestlers as, we, as the world is today. So assuming that there's no native implementation, this is talking about what web content, JS IPFS running in a web page today under an HTTP loaded web page needs in order to be able to connect. Uh, and the CID v1 base 32 work is the highest priority because that affects the contents of the repos. That affects everybody who's adding things today with a, with a CID that's not base 32 compatible Will either need to be migrated or we blow it away like we blow away our repos and web content today. Another issue that we have to figure out at some point. Uh, but that becomes because of the nature of how the data is stored, CID v1 base 32 is the highest priority for, for 2020 in order to set us up for the next you know, you know, five years of, of uh, IPFS work without having to worry about the, the addressing format, compatibility of the addressing format. At the next phase that Clem, it was interesting. So we didn't actually do these groupings of category, uh, like compatibility, connectivity, UX, uh, intentionally, that actually we were talking about the projects themselves. And that, that grouping really ended up, cl that clustering of topics ended up happening on its own. So that was kind of fascinating that we were kind of, uh, I didn't add the category stuff until later. So we were actually just looking at the list of projects and me and Hugo and Lytle just like it, intensely for hours talking about each one of these and slowly doing this sort uh, based on the, the, the technical bits behind each one of them. And afterwards I went through and did the grouping. I was like, oh, we have, we have, a, we have a, an emergent clustering. It's very important that connectivity, it makes sense that connectivity is gonna be the biggest thing in our mind because everything else we can fix back after, the, after the fact. Um, so that, that's kind of what came out of this. We still have some next steps around uh, reconciling this list with the like i feel like it'll probably end up being like us attacking these things because the http world will live on for the next probably forever uh reconciling this against what a native implementation looks like and how those two interplay together when you have these mixed hybrid environments is which we'll probably have forever uh so we need to have a good story for how that works what the developer workflows are for that what connectivity options happen when you have a JSIPFS node running in an HTTP web page, but you also have a, a native node running in the same, same browser. We don't want to do things like say, bundling happy. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's good for now, but that's not, at the end of 2020, we want to be able to have a better story for, for how we actually handle that type of situation. But the idea of a web server running inside a web browser is something that probably is really powerful and will probably live on. So if we have an even better story for that, then, then a, uh, you know, a, a crazy module stack that isn't designed for that environment necessarily, uh, and that'll, that'll probably benefit the entire D-Web kind of uh, space itself, since I, I suspect that will be, that's kind of like the simplest P2P local, local network with two browsers to talk to each other scenario that you can think of, right? So IPFS is a really a level up on top of that in terms of architecture and complexity and, and feature set. Uh, but as a test case for that, it's just having MDNS and, and a web server like you you got a direct browser browser connection to that point. So if we can prove that out, that kind of will float all boats, and we are going to need that probably for the long term in some form. Anyway, so that that's kind of what we talked about in terms of twenty twenty planning. Uh, you know, like loose loose uh, looks at uh, what the timeline might look like. Um, uh, really, just uh, blue sky putting it up there. What, what what would be the big pieces? And then uh, spend some time digging into some of these these deeper problems. Like uh, uh, we've spent a bunch of time talking about the web UI problem with Brave, and really now now Lytle's almost done implementing that. Uh, and then some of the other long term problems, like you know we have IPFS. How how many IPFS nodes can we run on one machine? Ideally, it would just be one. So <laughs> and 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 really that ends up speaking back to the HTTP model as well. So if we really only want one 
IPFS node running on any machine at any given time, you it, it, we're going to be able we're going to have to speak HTTP to that node, even in that that perfect ish ish world. Um, so lots lots of discussions. All the notes are linked in this in this HackMD. The uh, one of the fun parts was the next couple of days where we actually dug into a technical problem. So we said, okay, should we say spend two days hacking on WebRTC connectivity? Should we spend two days uh, hacking on uh, the other different routing optimizations and things like that? Should we spend two days hacking on performance? And while doing the interop test conversion to async, Hugo found that the the IPF, JS IPFS tests for basic ads were sometimes pathologically slow. He found it was taking a minute sometimes to be able to add a, a, a not really file that should not take a minute to add. So uh, we said, okay, let's take those two days and kind of dig into to the ways that we could solve it and identifying where the slowdown was coming from. And it looked like it was IO bound, like there was uh, some, there's two issues, two, two major pieces that he ended up investigating. Like just, he implemented the data store API with uh, just an in-memory database to see if there is a improvement there. And because uh, we use a level DB wrapper running in a web page that talks to uh, index DB, which actually in Chrome is also level DB in the back end. So we have level DB section there. Uh, and uh, on, on Firefox, it's a, kind of similar, but it's SQLite on the back end that backs uh, IDB. Actually, they might even move to a different data store at this point on the back end. But either way, you have a storage wrapper is talking to a storage wrapper, talking to a storage wrapper, talking to storage, talking to this. So what happens when we remove some of those wrappers in their early? Early results were showing a massive improvement, but then when he when he when he uh, talked to uh, IDB natively, we weren't seeing the same results. Uh, but one thing that we did notice is that when uh, IPFS adds, when you're adding a file, it chunks it all up and makes all those writes individual writes to the data store. Those were not wrapped up in a transaction, so it was do, you making each one of those writes at the IDB level as an individual transaction, uh, and IDB provides transaction semantics to be able to take all those writes, bundle them up, and then make the file system, the file IO happen in, in one large transaction as opposed to a whole bunch of different independent atomic writes. This is a lesson that we learned in browser land, and, and it really the lesson played out here as well. Once adding transaction support, got about a 50% increase in performance in both ads and, and I think it was in gets as well, but I don't remember exactly. But the, the rights for sure, it, we had a massive performance increase. So that has not landed yet, as far as I know. And we're still waiting on, on, on Hugo to merge those changes. But that will be a significant improvement in IPFS and web pages. Uh, and was it also Node as well that we get those, the batching yeah. improvement? Yeah, yeah. Batching uh, helped both. Uh, like personally, <sighs> I'm, I'm really excited for Brave because in Brave, uh, Everything is in the single page uh, context, so any performance improvement will be, you can eyeball it that it's faster, so it will be super cool. So that that, that was it. Then we went our, went our separate way. It was a fun week. Thank you for this, making it happen. This, it yeah, it's it's a little intense when you get you know, it's actually the small group can be can be kind of more intense than the big group sometimes because you can go go deep. Or something. And uh, next time, I think we need to get a little more organized and have the uh, the IPFS web UI and desk, the browser desktop and web UI week. We'll push it up to maybe five people, six people. I feel like when we had 14 people in Lisbon, it was like too, too much all at once. And three people was, was super intense. We'd probably that's, bump it up to that, five or six. That's the trick to keep keep it at five. Yeah, we we just need to figure out what what Hawk's, uh testing schedule is at school and make sure that we schedule around so that you can join us. Yeah, especially like some big overarching UX thing across like companion like web in general and desktop. Um, that would be interesting. Uh, cool. Thank you, Dietrich. Uh, the last item on the agenda, experiments in collaborative website hosting, it's lazy versus prefetched co-hosting. I could like probably write more, but I don't think it would be more, <laughs> like it would be clearer, no. Uh, I apologize, I was not sure what to write, but 
it's basically uh, this co-hosting spec, which we have uh, been low-key experimenting. Uh, those are explorations around uh, tools and conventions for co-hosting websites using MFS. So we, we want to see what's possible with existing APIs and namely MFS uh, without like adding anything new to the IPFS core APIs. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's the spec and the spec, uh, the first draft of the spec landed uh, this week. Uh, it's very simple. It's just adding, removing and updating basically. Um, however, from, uh, from uh, the implementation hacked it, uh, he created a simple bash script. So if you want to see how this co-hosting would work, there's a shell script you can download and it just had has commands for adding, removing, and syncing, basically. And uh, from that, uh, Hack noticed that if he, maybe I'll go to the spec, that may be easier, easier to show. Uh, so when you, when you copy stuff to MFS, so here you can see we are copying IPFS resource from IPFS namespace, right? To MFS under co-hosting directory. So this operation is interesting because we basically just create a pointer in MFS to this IPFS path. Um, the thing is, it's just a pointer. It's there. This operation does not touch data store. So if this hash represents entire Wikipedia, uh, you have entire Wikipedia in your MFS. However, it's not physically on your uh, MFS. It's not on your machine. You go to web UI, you go to files in web UI, or you use command line uh, to traverse this directory under MFS. And with each like level, each file you open there, it will be dynamically loaded from the network because it's not physically on your machine yet. So uh, initially it was a bug. <laughs> so the idea was to, okay, we need to add this step here to ensure uh, contents are in the local repo. So there's this command which lists our uh, sub blocks of entire DAC, which has a side effect of prefetching everything to your local repository. So that is why, uh, like if we do this before copying, that ensures uh, everything that's in MFS, it's physically on your machine. Uh, sorry for this long introduction, but I feel it's necessary to understand what's happening here. So lazy co-hosting, it's the idea of, that it's not actually a bug, it's a feature, right? And it's a very cool feature because I don't, you may have a small disk and you are not able to store entire Wikipedia, but thanks to this property of MFS of not being proactively uh, like prefetching stuff, uh, you can store pointers uh, to, to content that you don't have fully, but you may have a subset of Wikipedia, right? If I go to uh, Wikipedia right now and start going through some pages, uh, those pages I visit are cached on my local network, uh, on my local uh, repository. I don't have entire Wikipedia, I have a small subset of Wikipedia. And the idea behind lazy co-hosting is that that's actually a feature. So some people may not want to store entire Wikipedia, some people want to just ensure all the Wikipedia resources they visited are being protected from being garbage collected, are pinned or are basically co-hosted. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm able to like host a lot of websites and I basically just uh, share and provide content to other people, only the content I've actually visited. It works like this right now. So the only 
feature on top of how IPFS works right now is this implicit pinning. Right now, when you go to a page, it's saved and cached in your local repository. However, at any time, garbage collection might remove it unless it's pinned. If it's added to MFS, even as this pointer of an entire website is added as a pointer, if you have any sub resources of that in your local repo and garbage collection is happening, that will protect them from being the garbage collected. So that's the background behind lazy co hosting. There's an issue I linked. It's, it, it's maybe easy to uh, explain in shorter terms because I see it fits on my screen, but I felt uh, uh, this explanation uh, was necessary to understand how powerful this is. You are able to like have the entire Wikipedia as a pointer and you can traverse it and from a web website, uh, like uh, in web browser or from web UI interface and you progressively get content fetched. So this lazy co-hosting idea is to, uh, is a proposal to like extend or to change or tweak this co-hosting experiment um, in a way that like makes use of this powerful primitive and uh, some exploration how the user interface would look like. So the challenges are how do we communicate difference between full snapshot, full co-hosting and this lazy where I only uh, share what I actually loaded my, like on my own. And then when user wants to uh, go to a Wikipedia page and wants to like co-host Wikipedia, what does, what does that mean? Because Wikipedia is like 40 gigabytes or 60 gigabytes with images. I'm not sure. It's like ridiculous. And to fetch that, uh, if you like uh, start a uh, click, yeah, I want to co-host this. And if you start prefetching entire thing, should that be a blocking operation or a background operation? And then we don't have API to track progress of this fetch. So it's a, a very, uh, a, an open question. And there are challenges. Uh, how to communicate with user and how to build those uh, interfaces. Uh, I wrote some uh, notes here, basically uh, either we, I sort of tend to lean on a side where we do lazy co-hosting by default and only if user like explicitly said, yeah, I want entire Wikipedia or I want uh, this entire website uh, physically uh, on my disk. Uh, so that's, that's my, where I am right now, but it needs a lot more work. And I'm really happy, thank you, Hug, for uh, like creating those scripts and working on spec and helping us pushing this uh, co-hosting uh, experiment further, because this is exactly why I started this experiment, to like discover those hidden gems in our APIs and what user experiences could we build around them. Because this uh, MFS property, of being a pointer, a lazy pointer was there always. We just did not think uh, in a way how to productize that or how to expose that to user. And I really want to remove this pinning interface from IPFS Companion, make it mo more like seamless. And I feel like if Companion could, would do this like lazy pinning uh, with like optional uh, switch to full, that would be much better experience, even for, for, for companion, but it could be much more. So there's a discussion with more words. I'll shut up now, sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, hey, how does this relate to IPFS co-host? I saw you said that you PR'd co IPFS co-host as well. What is the difference between the co-host script that you did and IPFS? IPFS co-host would be a more beautiful CLI in Node.js. Uh, that's something Oli did before with pin API, but I PR to change the, to match the spec. Uh, you had also a very good idea of basically turning it into a library, like co-hosting library yes. that people can embed in their applications. And basically in IPFS Companion and in IPFS Desktop, we would, we would just use this library. So that's uh, also, uh, the, the shell script is just a super simple shell script uh, and it's just to quickly play with it or add it to cron job. So you can like put it on your server and run it. 
But honestly, if you have Node there, you could run this IPFS co-host as well. Uh, it's just uh, easier to iterate. By the way, probably you answered this on your comment five hours ago, but what about the idea of getting new snapshots every X time, like 12 hours? If it's a lazy co-hosting, what would happen? That's, uh, that, that's one of open questions. Uh, the way I've been thinking, if it's lazy, I still want to know when like the root, like the, the website got updated and the pointer mm. in my MFS would still get updated. So if I want to go to MFS, I would see those snapshots. So it would still be lazy, right? We could just, uh, the, the open question is, how do we distinguish? Distinguish, yeah. So you, what, uh, how this prefetching would work? Would you just, I want to prefer, pre prefetch every website I have co-hosted. No, probably not. Uh, but <laughs> I, I want to prefetch everything apart from Wikipedia or I want to add Wikipedia as a lazy. However, I want to add this other smaller website as a full snapshot because it's my website. I want to co-host it fully. So uh, that's an open question. How do we distinguish it at the MFS le level? We could uh, like add a suffix to a directory name or something. I'm not sure. Um, it's an open, open question both on the like low level, how to represent that difference between lazy and full uh, on the MFS side, especially, uh, and also like in, in UX. So if anyone got ideas. Uh, I have a really simple idea. Instead of a suffix or prefix yep. or something like that, a simple file inside it, the main name, indicating if it's lazy or full or having one by default and just indicating otherwise. Or we could right. have a separate, separate subdirectories like lazy yeah, or for whole. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's probably an implementation. It work. Uh, probably harder uh, to answer is how to represent that in like companion U UI. This choice when you want to decide when you want to decide is it lazy or full and like how to give this uh, UI to a user who may not have the, all the technical context. So probably we should tell, oh, Wikipedia is like 60 gigabytes in size. Uh, we need to- Do you really want to? Do you really want to? Edit, <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. It. Yeah, so that's like uh, where we are with this lazy co-hosting. It's in the discussion phase right now, but it's pretty powerful primitive, I feel. And I had discussion uh, with uh, Michelle Hertzfield uh, last week on uh, the pinning, generally the, how pinning in IPFS ecosystem works. And I mentioned this MFS experimentation we have. So we probably, I hope we'll, uh, also, I will also uh, bounce on ideas uh, with her uh, to see how we can refine this UX. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm super excited about, I think there are higher level workflows in re republishing, sharing, saving, archiving, and republishing that'll get unlocked by this initial low level work and experimentation. It is really exciting. Yeah, and also we s sort of start seeing there are problematic or missing APIs for things like, when I, uh, is this block or is this CID in local repository? Is it fully in this local repository or only a part of it? or how many percent of this thing is local? <laughs> uh, we don't either don't have APIs or we, you need to chain multiple APIs to, to get that. So that's also like super powerful uh, forcing function on like thinking about those needs and what those things could unlock. Uh, so uh, expect more on co-hosting in the future, I guess. <laughs> Guys, uh, we are over time. Uh, unless there's anything more to add, uh, I, I'm really happy. We are back on track with this call and see you next week. Bye.